Welcome back for the second lecture of the course. This cartoon you've seen before, so this depicts the entire system that we're going to look at in the course. But for today we're going to focus on radiation and there in particular the sun of course is important as a major source of uh, radiative energy but also the clouds that influence the solar energy but also uh, radiate themselves as we will see. So if we look at the surface energy balance which we introduced during the first lecture it's the net radiation that is our topic for today and so we're going to look at all of the four components of net radiation separately. So before we're going to dive into the details let's first have a look at the global perspective. Here we see the reanalysis data again that we've also seen during the first lecture and what we're going to focus on is the diurnal cycle for a few days in March. And so well you see at the top that we start at the 1st of March at 0 UTC. Well if it's 0 UTC the sun is well overhead uh, above the Pacific and Europe which is in between somewhere is in the dark. It's night over there. And what you very clearly see is a very bright spot where the sun is right overhead but you can also see that it's more or less located right over the equator and that also makes sense if you are in March because then uh, you're quite close to the equinox. Well let's see how things develop. Well if we follow the diurnal cycle you see the sun moving from east to west and apart from this big uh, bright spot there are some other things that you see and for instance if we stop the movie over here uh, you very clearly see that there are dark spots and, and brighter spots. The dark spots are the places where we have clouds which uh, shade uh, the surface and they prohibit the radiation to reach the surface. On the other hand, there are also a few very bright spots. For instance, if you uh, look to the east of, uh, of Africa, you see very bright spots where there's a lot of radiation. So apparently you have very thin or even absent clouds over there. Now it's a very clear uh, signal that there's a very strong diurnal cycle, but on top of that, there's a lot of local variation and short-term variation that's related to clouds. Apart from the diurnal cycle, we can also have a look at the yearly cycle. And to prevent that we are looking at a lot of fast moving diurnal cycles, we focus on one time at the day. We look at local noon when the sun is right overhead over Europe and Africa. And now we start on January 1st and there we see again the same bright spot, but now the bright spot has moved uh, to the south because it's winter so the sun is overhead further to the south and then if we start the uh, movie well we see that the bright spot stays at the same location we see a lot of variation due to clouds and we also see the bright spot moving northward gradually so now we are in April and uh, it's right overhead over Africa but you also see that Europe already starts to get more and more radiation so apparently there's a very clear and of course everybody knows that because that gives the seasonal cycle but there's a very clear variation of the location of this bright spot going from south to north in, the, in our own summer in August 
and now we are in September and moves back over the equator and further south again. So these two movies show us that there's two cycles that are very much dominating when you look at radiation. It's the diurnal cycle and it's the yearly cycle. And on top of that, there's all kinds of short term variations related to cloudiness. Well, the questions to be answered today during this lecture are the following. One of those is to see how the atmosphere affects radiation that arrives at the Earth's surface. And well, we already saw in this movie uh, the variation to clouds. So that is one of the things, but also the different uh, constituents of the uh, atmosphere play a role there. And we also can quantify how uh, transparent the atmosphere is in terms of transmissivities. Well, then we focused on the incoming radiation, but we also, of course, if we look at the net radiation, we also need to know how much radiation is uh, going away from the surface. So the reflectivity or albedo of the surface also plays a role. And it just appears not to be just a number, but it depends on a number of things like solar angle and viewing angle and also wavelength. And finally, we will uh, pay some attention to incoming and outgoing long wave radiation uh, at the surface as the last parts of the net radiation. Well, the clips that you viewed before, they have uh, focused on the effect of the atmosphere on the incoming radiation. And so the effect of the at atmosphere on incoming radi radiation has to do with uh, absorption and emission and scattering. So these are the processes. And the effect that these processes have on incoming radiation are effects on the directional composition. So where does the radiation come from? Direct versus diffuse, but also on the spectral composition, what is scattered more, which, which wavelengths, and also uh, which wavelengths are absorbed more. And in the end, the main effect of the atmosphere, of course, is to remove part of the uh, radiation. Well, this extinction uh, we can express in terms of vertical optical mass, mass and relative optical mass, as you've seen. And the extinction is also uh, different for specific wavelengths. And if you look at the uh, absorption, then it's the concentration of the compound that you're looking at, but also the extinction coefficient of the specific compound. Well, if you integrate all of this over the full atmosphere, we express that in terms of a transmissivity. And there we can make a distinction between monochromatic, so just for a single wavelength, or broadband where we integrate over all wavelengths. And we also made a distinction between so-called beam transmissivity, so where the transmissivity is followed going along the solar beam, versus the all direction uh, transmissivity, so where we integrate over all directions of incoming radiation. In the videos that you've watched as a preparation for this lecture, uh, you learned a lot about transmissivities. And so now it is time to put that into practice. And we're going to do an exercise. We have some observations that are shown in the table. The first column shows you the global radiation and the second column gives you the diffuse radiation for two days in September. And additionally, there are a num number of things given. The eccentricity factor for September 3 and 4, which is 0.9824. The Solar zenith angle at noon is 45 degrees, and for this exercise, you can assume that the solar constant is 1365 watts per square meter.
So that is what is given to you. And now the question is to, for you to calculate the number of things. And the first step that you would need is to calculate the capital I or the beam radiation for both days. Well, once you have that, the next step would be to determine the broadband beam transmissivity for both days. And finally, to determine the all direction transmissivity for both days. Well, the definitions are given here, but they are repetitions of what was shown in the introductory lectures. And you might need some equations from the book. So take your book with you and uh, have a look and try to solve these questions. And once you have done that, you can continue by answering the questions. Uh, and after you've done that, I will give you the correct answers and also the way that you can calculate them. I hope you were able to solve these questions by yourselves, but just for completeness, I give you some uh, hints about how to do the calculation. Well, if we're looking at the beam radiation, we need to uh, subtract the diffuse radiation from the global radiation, because then you only have the radiation that comes from the direction of the sun. So K down minus D, that's the global radiation minus diffuse radiation gives you the amount of radiation that comes from the direction of the sun. But now we're not interested in the radiation on a surface, uh, a horizontal surface, but we need to look at a surface that is perpendicular to the solar beam. So that's why we have to divide by the cosine of the zenith angle. Well, you see that for September 3, that's a pretty small number. Um, so there's very little radiation coming from the direction of the sun which means that all of the radiation or most of the radiation is diffuse, probably due to clouds. Whereas for September 4, there's a lot of radiation coming from the direction of the sun. Then the next step is if we want to determine the beam transmissivity, we need to know the amount of radiation from the direction of the sun that arrives at the top of the atmosphere. Well, the only thing that that depends on is the eccentricity factor. And that was given, so the the amount of radiation at the top of the atmosphere from the direction of the sun for these days is 1341 watts per square meter. Well, if you know the I0 and the I, you can determine the beam transmissivity. And here again, you see that the beam transmissivity for September 3 is very low due to cloudy conditions, whereas for September 4, it's about 70%. So that's a relatively transparent atmosphere. If we are looking at the uh, surface energy balance, it's not that important where the uh, sun, uh, the radiation is coming from. In the end, we are interested in the total amount of radiation that arrives at the surface, whether it's direct or diffuse. It's not that interesting if you're only interested in the amount of radiation. So the transmissivity that gives us information about how much radiation arrives at the surface is just determined on the uh, relative magnitude of the global radiation at the surface as compared to the global radiation at the top of the atmosphere. Well, so to determine that, we need to beam radiation at the top of the atmosphere, which we determined already before. And then we have to correct for the cosine of the zenith angle. So at the top of the atmosphere, there's about 950 watts per square meter available. And then the question is, which fraction of that arrives at the surface? And there we see for September 3, it's about 40% of that, whereas for September 4, it's about 80%. So if you look at just the total amount of radiation and are not that interested in the direction, we see that the transmissivity on September 3 is also still lower. It's a cloudy day, but it's only 50% uh, of the transmissivity of uh, the very sunny day. So the difference is not as uh, dramatic as for the beam transmissivity. Hopefully this gives you some idea about why the different transmissivities are relevant and also how you can compute them. Well, enough said about the incoming radiation. Now let's focus on the amount of reflected shortwave radiation. Well, if you would think of that, the first thing you would shout is, oh yeah, it's the albedo that tells you the fraction of radiation that's reflected. Well, is there variation in the albedo? Well, there's quite some. So here we have a global map where you see that the uh, albedo varies over a significant uh, range and over land it can go from uh, as low as about 10% uh, up to 50%, very much depending on uh, 
the amount of vegetation that's a very important determining factor uh, bare soil but and also whether there uh, is snow although in this case uh, the snowy surfaces are not uh, included because that would give even a higher albedo so there's spatial variation but are there other reasons why the albedo varies well he what we see here is a photograph taken from a tower and there are two different uh, configurations and the difference between the left picture and the right picture is the relative position of the sun relative to the observer so if we look at the left picture uh, the observer looks from the tower to the uh, forested surface and the sun is behind the observer so what we see is that the observer actually looks at the uh, part of the uh, forest which is highlighted by the sun whereas if we have the opposite situation where the sun is in front of the observer actually the observer sees the shadow side of the uh, trees so you already see just from uh, the qualitative observation that this gives a significant difference in the albedo or the reflectivity because the amount of solar radiation is the same and but the relative uh, position of the observer relative to the direction of the sun is different and another thing that is very clearly visible on the uh, left picture is that there is a hot spot so very close to the observer um, we see a quite high reflectivity which is higher than if we go further away so apparently also the local uh, position what that the observer is looking at makes a difference Another effect that is related to the relative position of observer and the sun has to do with what we call specular reflection or effect it's the surface acts as a mirror probably you know this quite well when you look at the sunset at the beach and at least in the Netherlands the sun sets uh, over the sea and so if the sun is at a very low position uh, over the horizon and you're looking at the sunset then there's a lot of specular reflection of the uh, solar light on the uh, sea surface well actually similar things can happen also over vegetated surfaces so again to the left you see a situation where the sun is behind the observer uh, but on the other hand at the right hand side you see a situation where the sun is in front of the observer and in that case just like during the sunset you see that the uh, surface of the leaves shows some specular reflection and so if you would express this in terms of the fraction of radiation that is reflected by the surface it will be quite different between the two situations well the way that we express this or could express this is what we call the bidirectional reflection distribution function well it's a mouthful and the just for short we call that BRDF and what it is meant for it's to express how the reflectance of the surface or depends both on the uh, position of the Sun so the source of radiation but also on the position of the observer so let's first focus on the position of the, the Sun uh, that's defined by two angles it's the zenith angle so the angle of the solar beam relative to the vertical and the azimuth angle so that's the position to the east to the west or to the south but exactly the same set of angles we can also uh, apply to the observer so if the observer comes in uh, also that is uh, defined by two angles a zenith angle and a uh, azimuth angle so we have a situation where we are interested in the reflection of the surface where that reflection might depend on two angles for the source of radiation and two angles for the uh, observer and so actually if we want to fully define the reflectivity of the surface it would depend on a lot of things well just let's have a look at what this looks like and here we have a figure that more or less summarizes what this BRDF looks like uh, to the uh, left we have a situation for a winter day where the zenith angle is uh, 
quite large, which means that the solar elevation angle is quite low. So the so sun is only 30 degrees above the horizon. And it's at midday, so the azimuth angle for the sun is 180 degrees. And so what you see in the figure is the dependence of the reflectivity, both on the viewing zenith angle, which is indicated by the radial distance from the surface. So if the observer is right overhead, then you're quite close to the surface, whereas if the observer is uh, uh, quite close to the, to the surface, so looking at a large zenith angle, it's really at the edge of the circle. And on the other hand, the uh, position, uh, the clockwise position, you might say, indicated by uh, angles between 0, 45 uh, degrees, etc., etc., is the viewing zenith angle. So now, if we are interested in a situation that we saw to the left of the two of the two slides with the uh, uh, photographs, those were the positions where the sun and the observer were uh, at the same side. So the sun was behind the observer. And that is actually what's happening to the left of this figure. So the sun is in the south, but the observer also looks from the south. And there you see a very high reflectivity in the uh, red colors uh, on the left-hand side, whereas the lower reflectivities are on the right-hand side. So this red spot is actually what we call the hot spot of reflectivity. Then if we go to a summer day with a higher solar zenith angle, we see this hot spot again, but it's not as intense and it's also a little bit displaced. So this hot spot is very intense uh, if their sun is quite close to the horizon, but it's still present if you have higher uh, zenith angles. You might wonder why we pay so much attention to the BRDF, why it is that important. Well, the first thing is to show you just that the albedo is not just a number, but reflectivity depends on a lot of things. But there are also practical implications. And one example, for instance, is given here. You see to the left a picture from the Tropomi satellite instrument. And it is an instrument that provides us with information about air pollution, specifically NO2. Uh, in the atmosphere. And it's a relatively new instrument that gives information at a high spatial resolution. The figure to the right shows us how this works. And so the working principle of this instrument is that it actually looks at the absorption of solar light uh, by the atmosphere. So NO2 absorbs at specific wavelengths. And the idea is that uh, this absorption or the relative absorption is measured by the instrument. But this solar radiation is not arriving at the satellite directly. No, it comes from the sun, goes through the atmosphere, down to the surface, is reflected there, and then it travels again through the atmosphere. So the radiation travels up downward and upward through the atmosphere and is reflected by the surface. So the surface reflectance plays a major role in the strength of the surface. And since this satellite is not just looking straight downward, but it looks under an angle, and actually this angle depends very much on the position in the uh, satellite image, there's very much a need for detailed information about how this directional dependence of the surface reflectivity, how that works and how you should use that. So this is a, one example where the BRDF plays an important role. Another example where we could use the BRDF for is to understand how and why the broadband albedo varies for different services and under different circumstances. Well, very generally speaking, the BRDF tells us that the reflectivity depends on the wavelength, the two angles for the incoming radiation, so that is the zenith angle and the azimuth angle, and also two angles for the outgoing radiation or the observer. So that's the outgoing zenith angle and the outgoing azimuth angle. But if we're looking at the surface energy balance, we actually don't care where the radiation goes. If it's reflected, we don't care in what direction it's reflected. So as well, we could integrate over the entire hemisphere uh, the different angles of outgoing radiation. So both the outgoing zenith angle and the outgoing azimuth angle. And that is what the equation below shows. It shows that 
if we perform this integration over the outgoing zenith angle and azimuth angle, we see that the reflectivity actually only depends on wavelength and the incoming zenith angle and the incoming uh, uh, azimuth angle. So we got rid of two angles because, as I said before, for the surface energy balance, we are not interested where the radiation goes. But still, the reflectivity does depend on the direction uh, of the incoming radi radiation. Well, the radiation that we are looking at, if we are looking at the uh, surface energy balance, is broadband and it comes from a range of directions. But we could just as well integrate over all the wavelengths that are relevant. And so for shortwave radiation, that is a limited range of wavelengths that we have to integrate over. And we also have to integrate over all incoming directions. But those incoming directions, well, they depend on how the radiation is actually uh, compo composed uh, from direct radiation and diffuse radiation. So if there's a lot of direct radiation, there's a very clear directional dependence of the incoming radiation. Whereas if you have a lot of diffuse radiation, there is hardly any directional uh, dependence. And so we have to weigh the reflectivity by the amount of radiation that comes from a certain direction. And so that's why the albedo, so just the R, which you normally simply would say, well, that's the ratio between reflected radiation and uh, incoming radiation, is such an ugly uh, ratio with a threefold integral at the top and a threefold integral at the bottom. And you see that the reflectivity that depends on wavelength and incoming zenith angle, incoming azimuth angle, needs to be weighed by the global radiation for each wavelength and to the two incoming angles. And so a very important message from this very ugly uh, equation is the lower point, and that is that the albedo depends both on the directional and the spectral properties of the incoming radiation. So even for a given surface, the albedo is not just a number. The albedo depends on a number of things. Well, let well let's leave the spectral dependence uh, out for the moment and just focus on the directional dependence of the albedo. Here we have a situation, we have a graph with the albedo from two different days but for the same surface. So there's data from May 22 and May 23 and you see that for the dashed line there's a very clear dependence during the day of the albedo whereas for the uh, solid line the albedo is rather constant. And so now question to you is, which day or which days are cloudy? Is it May 22? Is it May 23? Are both days cloudy or is none of them cloudy? Well, the question is up to you and try to answer it. The answer is that May 22 is the cloudy day. And why is that? Well, if you have a cloudy day, you have mostly diffuse radiation, so the directional composition of the radiation does not vary by during the day. And so during the entire day, the radiation always comes from all directions. Whereas for a sunny day, the radiation during or close to sunrise and sunset comes from close to the horizon, whereas during midday, it comes from uh, a position higher in the sky and so the directional composition varies during the day and as a result we've seen before also the albedo varies during the day. In the exercise we look at how the albedo varies during the day but actually during a sunny day it's not the time of day that matters but it's the solar zenith angle and so this figure shows you for different surfaces how the albedo depends on solar zenith angle. And there you see that actually the numbers on the axis are the solar altitude, which is the complementary angle of the solar zenith angle. That is low solar altitude, so close to sunrise and sunset, the albedo is high, and that's very similar to what we saw with the observations in the exercise. Here you also see that for very tall surfaces, so like spruce and pine forests, the albedo 
in general is quite low, about 10%, whereas for short grass that we see the typical value of about 20 to 25%. But here we focus on the dependence on solar scenic angle. So there's a clear dependence, high albedo at a uh, high solar zenith angle, so low solar altitude, and a low albedo when the sun is more uh, overhead. Well, how can we explain that? Well, let us start with the situation where we have a large solar zenith angle, so a small solar altitude, sun is close to the horizon. What we see here is a, an idealized kind of canopy, so a number of very simple obstacles, and the solid line at the top of these obstacle shows us where they are illuminated directly and where also they will reflect. Well, the typical reflection coefficient of an individual leaf would be about 25%, which means that 75% of the radiation is absorbed and only 25% is reflected. Well, what we show here is the small arrows is only the part of the radiation that is reflected downwards. So the rest of the obstacle reflects upward towards the uh, atmosphere and that contributes to reflection of radiation. The downward reflection is more or less trapped in the canopy because it's only 25% of the first surface but when it's reflected downwards and it hits another leaf on another obstacle it's again 75% of the radiation that's absorbed and only 25% that is reflected and chances are large that it's further reflected downwards and into the canopy and a little bit might escape the canopy again and be reflected upward. Well, this is the situation for a large solar zenith angle. Then if we look at the situation where we have a small solar zenith angle, so the sun is nearly overhead, there's a different part of the canopy that is uh, illuminated directly. Actually, it's a larger part. But also the radiation penetrates much deeper into the canopy. And so a large part of the canopy that's illuminated reflects the radiation into the canopy again. So there's a lot of internal reflection and more importantly, a lot of absorption of internally reflected radiation, which means that a large part of the radiation is what we call trapped in the canopy. And this is the explanation why for a large solar scene, small solar zenith angle, so a large solar elevation angle, uh, the albedo is smaller than for a situation close to sunrise or sunset as depicted in the left figure. Well, until now we've given a lot of attention to the directional dependence, but we get briefly back to the uh, wavelength dependence. What you see in the figure here is the spectral properties of a leaf. And so the part of the spectrum that we're looking at is mostly short wave radiation. And there are two wavelength bands that we are highlighted here. So there's to the left the visible range where we see a lot of uh, absorption and a little bit of reflectivity. So the lower line here is the uh, uh, reflectivity. And whereas in the near infrared, which is more around one micrometer, uh, we see a larger reflectivity. So actually, if you would like to uh, characterize a surface, uh, you could look at the relative importance of the reflectivity in the near infrared, which is large for a leaf, and the reflectivity for visible light, which is quite small for a leaf or a vegetated surface. And that is what the uh, normalized differential vegetation index or NDVI is based on. So you see to the top right the equation where the difference between the reflectivity in the near infrared and the visible range is the main determining factor for the NDVI and it's normalized by the sum of the reflectivities. Well, background here is again remote sensing because in these two wavelength bands we actually can observe the reflectivity. And here you see a figure of the NDVI for, uh, for instance, the Netherlands, where this is a way to map the vegetation using uh, remote sensing. However, the idea is very nice if you would have a full vegetation cover because then it's mainly determined by the uh, spectral properties of leaves. But if there's a partial uh, vegetation cover, then also the solar map 
this figure uh, actually illustrates the problem. So the green line is what we've seen before. It's the spectral dependence of the reflectivity of uh, vegetation, and uh, where we, again we see a high reflectivity in the near infrared and a low reflectivity in the visible range. But the yellow line is the reflectivity signature of the soil, which has a similar signature in the sense that it's somewhat higher in the uh, near infrared and somewhat lower in the visible range. It's not as clear as for a vegetation, but it is si si similar. So that means that if you have an incomplete cover of vegetation, you will see a mixture in your remote sensing image, which depends both on the reflectivity of the vegetation and of that of the soil. So then it gets somewhat harder to actually determine the, the amount of vegetation cover. Now it is time to summarize this part of the lecture. What we've seen at the start with the move is, is that the variation of shortwave radiation is really dominated by the diurnal cycle and the yearly cycle. And then next to that, there's also the effect of the atmosphere, which is in between the top of the atmosphere and the surface. And the effect of the atmosphere is both in terms of absorption and scattering. And apart from the spectral composition, also, also the directional composition in terms of diffuse and direct radiation. One important effect of the atmosphere is that it attenuates the radiation. And one way of quantifying that is to use the transmissivity. And you did an exercise in which you made computations related to both types of transmissivities that we looked at, the, the beam transmissivity and the all direction transmissivity. Then, we also need to look at the amount of shortwave radiation that goes out, that's reflected. And so there the reflectivity of the surface plays an important role. Well, in general, that depends on the solar angle, the viewing angle and the wavelength. But for the surface energy balance, the viewing angle is not really important. We don't care where the radiation is going. But we saw that the directional dependence may play a role. Now it is time to have a look at the other part of the net radiation, long wave radiation. 